welcome back. We're so glad that you could join us again uh, for our fifth week of this John series of reading the Bible together. And once again, we're continuing to talk about love. And um, so just as a reminder, uh, if you uh, have missed a couple of sessions, we've just been going through and talking about some of the verses uh, of 1 John that everyone remembers. It has a lot of real real memorable little nuggets in it. Um, and going through and giving them some context in the book of 1 John and in the rest of the Bible and just fleshing out what they mean and, and what we can learn from them. Um, and so two weeks ago, uh, we talked about dark uh, versus light. And last week we talked about what is love. Uh, and here's this week's verse. So 1 John 3, uh, verse 1, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it does not know him. So John says we're children of God. Uh, and that sounds really nice. You know, we like children. Well, it depends, you know, if you're a parent, it depends what day, time of day it is, if you like your children. But um, the, the thing is, it's really important for us to step back sometimes and look at scriptures from the lens of the ancient world, since that's where it was written, and remember what it would mean to be somebody's child in the ancient world. So uh, it means inheritance. That's, that's tied to being someone's child. It means protection for certain people and maybe not for others. If, if, they're, you know, if you are not in the right family, you don't have the kind of protection and the kind of privilege that you would in other families. And of course, it also means responsibilities. So uh, we're gonna look at this. Um, let's, uh, as usual, give a little bit greater context just within the book of First John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we see... <clears throat> Sorry, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So this touches actually on a little bit of everything we just talked about. It touches on inheritance, protection, and privilege. This idea that, that we're going to, to be like him and a little bit less on responsibilities, but that's going to come up a little bit later. It's in there, but just um, it's going to be a little bit more drawn out when we look. Uh, we're going to look at some of the context from chapter five as well. So do you want to explain a little bit about the privilege part? Um, yeah, I just want to zero in on one particular aspect of this. Mm -hmm. uh, it says that... Uh, uh, in verse 2 that you just read, Beloved, we are God's children now. Mm -hmm. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Mm -hmm. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Okay, what I want to look at there a little bit is this whole matter of, of, of life after death. Because one of the great things that as children of God that we have is the promise that uh, we will, that death doesn't end, uh, our physical death doesn't end our existence, uh, that we, we will be with God after that and uh, be with Christ. But the Bible doesn't tell us anything like as much as we'd like to know about what happens when we die. Hmm. Uh, sometimes we make things up and you see cartoons with people. Uh, floating on clouds. Yeah, floating on clouds playing harps. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, a lot of the things that are in popular culture and even sometimes in the church are basically made up and are not in the Bible. Hmm. Uh, now, what the Bible does talk about and some things that we can say with certainty, it does talk about a new heaven and a new earth. And of course, the most well-known and uh, some of the clearest teaching on that is in the last couple of chapters of the book of Revelation. Hmm. Revelation 21, I'll just read a few verses. Uh, I'm skipping through uh, the first four, 
four verses of, of Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Mm -hmm. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Uh, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. Now that's great. Uh, that tells us uh, that we will be with God and the things will be a lot better than they are now. There'll be no death. There'll be no mourning. There'll be no crying. All the things that cause us distress will be gone. Now, first of all, this is not floating around on clouds playing harps. Um, and when will it take place? It says, when he is revealed, uh, we will be like him and we will see him as he is. This is what John tells us. Now, uh, what is Jesus like and how will we be like him? Think about Jesus the last time his disciples saw him. Mm. Think about that period of time after the resurrection and before the ascension. Uh, what is Jesus like? Uh, the disciples saw him. He was in some kind of a body. And uh, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't a ghost. Uh, it talks about him. Yeah, he, he works really hard to prove he's not a ghost. Yes. Uh, he, 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 he eats, actually. He eats something. Uh, he eats a piece of fish. Um, he, he has them t touch the scar in his side when Thomas was having problems believing. He said, well, if you don't believe it, look, look here, right here. This is, you saw the spear or you heard about it. Here it is. Touch the scar. Uh, and he was in some kind of a body that it could be touched. He could do some things they couldn't do. He, he was able to appear uh, inside these, the locked room where they were uh, <laughs> hiding at one point. Uh, he was able to join the travelers on the road to Emmaus. Uh, it seemed like he came, he was there, he wasn't there, and then he was, and he was talking to them. And, <clears throat> and uh, eventually they recognized uh, him for who he was. Now, will we have bodies like that, something like that in the new heaven and the new earth? It, it, seems, it, may, it seems kind of that way. Uh, uh, it's, uh, this, is, this is the best hint that we have. It says, John says, when we see him, or uh, First John says, when we see him, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about when we die now? This is talking about what's going to happen in the new heaven and the new earth. And that's presumably, if you read the Revelation in context, that, that what John is talking about when he says when he is revealed is referring to uh, Jesus' second coming. So when all that is brought about and uh, the great conflicts at the end of things and, and the new heaven and the new earth, that's when all this will happen. But what about now? What happens now when we die? Um, we don't know. <laughs> but we do have a hint from Paul. This is in Philippians chapter 1. He's talking about his impending trial and whether or not what will happen after that trial and whether he will die or whether he will live. And he's basically saying, for to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress in joy and faith. Now, th there's a lot of rich teaching here, but what I want to zero in on is this little hint. Paul says, my desire is to, part, to depart and be with Christ that is far better. Now, what he's telling us here is that if, if he does die, he's going to be with Jesus. Mm. And what will that be like? We really don't know. Mm. Uh, we just know it'll be better than than, than it is uh, here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's uh, what we look forward to. Paul saw it as being uh, better than staying here, although he said staying here would, is, is nice because we get to work uh, more for Jesus. Uh, as we said, the Bible doesn't tell us all we'd like to know about life uh, after death, but every indication is that for those who, of us who are in Christ, it's going to be better than we could possibly imagine. And that's one of the great privileges, one of the great uh, uh, features of being in Jesus and one of the things he gives us. So 
Uh, we said that after we talked about this idea of, of inheriting eternal life and the privileges of, of being children of God, that we would circle back around to the responsibilities uh, of being children of God. And remember, we talked a, a couple of uh, three or four weeks ago about the fact that the book of 1 John sort of is written not in a line, but in a spiral. And so he has spiraled back around to this idea of the responsibility of being God's children in 1 John 5, verses 1 and 2. Everyone who believes that Jesus Christ has been born of God and everyone who, sorry, let me try that again. Uh, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. Now, uh, if we go back to the, the verse we started with, 1 John 1, 3, all who have, oh, sorry, the verse we started with is verse John 3, 1, sorry. 1 John 3, 1, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So we're, we're thinking about the fact that we are children of God, um, and, and what does that mean, right? This means... Um, that we love each other. This means that we love him and that we love each other. And part of the way we show we love him is by obeying his commandments. Now, also in 1 John, but back in chapter 1, there's this verse, all who have hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. And we talked about the importance of purity a couple of weeks ago. And then again, later on in chapter 1, verse 11, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So again, obeying God, purifying ourselves, loving each other. And then last of all, uh, in verse 18, little children, let us love in word or speech, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. So again, this, this loving God and loving each other, loving God means obeying his commandments, not just saying we love God. Uh, loving each other means loving each other in action, in service, and helping one another. So this is really important to remember, but it's also that important to remember that this isn't just a book of rules that John is laying out. If he did, they'd be probably a lot more linear and a lot less spiral. Um, but this is our response to God's love for us. We're not doing this because we're afraid if we don't do these things, we won't be God's children. We are God's children. And because we are God's children, because he loved us so much that he made us his children, our response is to love him and to obey his commands. So we are well and truly loved. We are adopted into this new family. And this gives us the privilege of eternal life, but also responsibility to this new family. So this week, let's find ways to rejoice in and care for what God has given us. And next week, we're going to look at what loving that new family does and does not look like. We hope you'll join us then. Thanks a lot. Thanks.